بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh In the previous surah, which is uh, Surah Al-Takweer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He posed their question, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you headed? Where are you going? And uh, that was rhetorically answered in the beginning of Surah Al-Infitar, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ Meaning that where you're headed, you're headed towards a day when the sky will split. So that means you're headed towards the day of judgment. Now in this surah, Surah Al-Infitar, there's another question. But this question is much more intense. And it's much more stunning. And it's a more embarrassing question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses. And this is where we ended off last week. And this is Qawli Ta'ala Ya ayyuhal insan ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem Ya ayyuhal insan Oh human being You know it's very difficult to translate or to communicate this in English language Ya ayyuhal insan It contains this address It contains so much emotion and so much warning and so much sympathy it even contains pain. It has pain in it, this question. Ya ayyuhal insan. You know when you feel sorry for someone and you say, oh man, what happened to you? This is how Allah Azza wa Jal is communicating now with the human. He's saying, ya ayyuhal insan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is turning to each and every single person, every individual, because he said insan. He didn't say, ya ayyuhal nas. O oh mankind, rather now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is speaking. He has turned to each and every single one of you. And He said, Ya ayyuhal insan. And you know, when you're sympathetic towards someone who just doesn't know, who's gone the wrong way, he doesn't know where the right way is. And he thinks he knows, but he isn't aware of his ignorance. You won't yell at this person. You'll try to guide him. You'll be saddened for him. You know, your tone will be different to him. This is what's happening in this ayah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word he used to refer to us was al-insan. And it is argued that this word comes from multiple roots. The first root that al-insan comes from is nasiya, to forget. Now the human was labeled in sand because of his forgetfulness. You know the sun, the stars, the sky, the earth, the oceans, every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget its duty to Allah. Doesn't forget to enslave itself to Allah and to worship Allah. But the human is a special case. The human forgets. The human is forgetful, so he was called insane. And other things were called other things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word insane to refer to us, to remind us of our forgetfulness. Also the word insane, it comes from the root word uns, which means affection and love. So the idea is that we develop an affection, we develop love, for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that makes us forget our real purpose on life. So the two are connected. Nasiya and uns. It's because of the love and the affection we have for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that makes us forget our duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ya ayyuhal insan. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem. What does he, this is the question here. 
What deceived you? You know, what deluded you? What conned you? What manipulated you? In other words, or sorry, other words are used in the Quran that refer or that have the meaning of being deceived. So there's the word khada'a, khana, khadala. But ghar, ma gharraka, this ghar, it has a totally different meaning. Gharra means to take someone who is basically careless, like a tourist. And you fool and you trick him so that you can take something out of him. You know, for example, a few days ago, my friend was telling me about his experience in one of the countries he traveled to. Obviously, he's a tourist because he traveled there and he's in the taxi. And the taxi already ripped him off. He told him that the price of the trip was a hundred. I don't know, in the, in the currency of that country. Anyway, he took out a hundred and he gives him a hundred. So the driver, he goes to him, fake, you know, give me another one. This one's fake. He returns it back to him. So he gives him another. He said, this is fake. He returns it. Then he gives him a third. He said, fake. Gives it back. And the fourth time he said, ah, this is right. No worries. Now, my friend, he went back to the hotel where he was, to the exchange power place. And he said, what's this? You're giving me fake notes. He goes, they fooled you. They tricked you. What they do, they have the fake notes. They'll take the real one. They'll swap it and they'll give you the fake one. So the idea is that this is ghar. This is a ghurur. To take someone that's careless and to fool him and to trick him. This is ghar. Someone is not watchful about what they're doing and how they spend their money. So someone comes and takes advantage of them. Now, when the human being is not careful, who takes advantage of him? Shaitan. The shaitan takes care of him. He tricks him and he fools him. And it was the shaitan, the same shaitan, that tricked and fooled the human in the previous surah. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the, in the previous surah, what was the deception that people fell into in the previous surah? Allah told, he told the people, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ that this word that the Prophet is uttering, this is not the word of a cursed devil. It's not the word of a cursed devil. So the shaitan, he was fooling, he ghar, fooling the masses into thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger, he was speaking the word of the devil and he was possessed and he was insane. And that the Quran was the word or was the devil's word. This is of the ghurur that happened in the previous surah. So when you're not careful, the shaitan, he feeds you the worst and worst of lies against the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمِ What deluded you away from your gracious Lord? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, what deceived you, what deluded you, from Allah, he didn't say, مَا غَرَّكَ بِاللَّهِ الْكَرِيمِ He said, what deluded you uh, concerning Allah? He said, مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ What deluded you concerning Rabbik, your Lord? Now, when the word Rabb comes in the Qur'an, it necessarily, necessarily illustrates, it illustrates a relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the name Allah, that's the proper name for the one we worship. That's the proper name, Allah. But the word Rabb is a word that necessarily denotes a relationship. You know, for example, when you say teacher, on the one hand, you already think of a student. On the other hand, there's a relationship, teacher, student. When you think of the boss, you think of the employee, on the other hand. When you think of master, on one hand, you think of a slave, on the other hand. So when Allah says, مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمِ We're immediately thinking that we're the slave. That's where our mind is going to. 
What the now? This is the meaning of the ayah. What deluded you? What deceived you concerning your Lord? In other words, He's your Lord. You're the slave. You're supposed to be in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're supposed to be performing the obligations and you're supposed to be abiding by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment. What happened to you? So Allah referred to himself as Rabb. So you can immediately think of your role. And what happened to you? Are you fulfilling your role or you're not? Are you fulfilling it? Or you have forgotten your role? Or affection to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken place? See, the answer of the question is in the question itself. When Allah referred to the human as being al insan This should bring guilt and shame to the slave and make him question his loyalty towards his master. You know, the agreement between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already been taken. Allah says, وَقَدْ أَخَذَ مِثَاقَكُمْ The promise had already been taken between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he said, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your master? Am I not your Lord? And you agreed. You said, قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا We all agreed. We said, yes, indeed, we bear witness to this. The agreement was simple. It was clear. There was no confusion. So what is it that deceived you and confused you from your job as, as a slave? What was it? Was it the money? Was it love for other than Allah? Was it the forgetfulness? You know? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully in this ayah, he, there's a connection between this surah and the previous surah. You know, in surah at taqweer this, the connection that happens in this surah and the previous two surah. In this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He spoke about the human distancing himself away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the previous surah, surah at taqweer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He spoke about the person that was distancing himself, He was turning himself away from what? From the Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam. Wa ma sahibukum bi majnoon. These people were turning away basically and running away from the Messenger. In the surah before this, surah Abasa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to us about the person that's distancing himself away from the revelation. So there's three distancing happening, three turning away happening. The first is happening from the revelation, the second from the messenger, and now the final one is that the human is distancing himself away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why are you turning away from the messenger and from revelation? Why are they turning away from these? Because they have no concern that they have a master. This is why this one comes at the end. Because the first two, turning away from the message and from the messenger, is because what's mentioned in this surah. They have no concern for their master, for Allah. And obviously, if you don't have concern for your master, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you don't acknowledge you're the slave, you have a job, what would you care about the other two? You'll distance yourself. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us the root, the root cause why people ran away from the message and from the messenger. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds to this ayah a name of his. And this name that he adds in this ayah, and he concludes this ayah with, this brings even more guilt and more shame to the slave. مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمِ It brings more shame and more guilt to me and you and to the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Kareem means the noble, the gracious, the generous. You know when the teacher is nice and he's noble? What happens to the student? He takes advantage and he starts getting deluded and starts convincing himself that he can get away with it, with whatever he does. Why? Because the teacher is Kareem. 
the teacher is a nice teacher. I can do whatever I want. You know, and we have this mentality, unfortunately, even amongst the Muslims. Ghafoor or Rahim. So this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds al kareem to give us the meaning of why many people are deceived. Because they convince themselves that because Allah is kareem and ghafoor or Rahim, that's all right, like we can, we can sort of slip a few things through. You know, the student of a noble teacher, if he's good and he disobeys the teacher, at the end of the year, if the student fails, the teacher will come to the student and he'll say, listen man, was not nice to you all along? Why did you fail? You know, why did you do what you did? The student will feel far worse than if he was told this by a mean teacher. If he was a mean teacher and an arrogant teacher, he wouldn't care if he failed, he didn't. But if he was a nice teacher, a very noble, generous teacher, and he failed in his class, if he comes to you and says to you, why? Why did you fail? What happened? I told you everything. You know, you'll feel far worse. So Allah adds this, بربك الكريم, so he can bring the guilt even more to you. Like this, your, your Lord was generous. So generous, what happened to you? What deceived you? What deluded you from your job as being a slave? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is failing these people. He's asking them in a loving manner. No matter What was it? Money? Love of wasting time? Family? Following your pathetic desire? What was it? Out of His grace and out of His generosity, He gave you so many things. Allah is Kareem. And from His nobility, from His generosity, He gave you honor. He gave them a human being honor. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Allah honored mankind. And a part of this honor is now mentioned in this day. How, was, how does the karam of Allah how does the generosity of Allah manifest in you? The answer is in this ayah, now the following ayah. Alladhi khalaqaka. That's how He showed you generosity. That He created you, that's the first thing. And alone, not only He created you, He also fasawak. He took care of you, He took care of your creation in the very finest detail. That's sawak, that's a taswiyah. He fashioned you perfectly. That's from the generosity, that's from the karam of Allah upon you. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity. And then finally, He fa'adalak. These are three stages. In where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showered you with His generosity. خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ And the final stage, فَعَدَلَكَ And that's the most important. فَعَدَلَكَ He balanced you. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created you. He fashioned you in the finest detail. And then He gave you a sense of balance. You walk with two feet. You're balanced. This is understood in the physical and in the spiritual 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 aspect. In both aspects. You know, the fluid in your E, if it's more in one E, you start feeling dizzy. Allah balanced it. Everything in your body is balanced. One side and the other, they're both balanced. And also it's understood as we said, in the spiritual side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already spoken to us in the previous surah about a balance we should have. What was that? Between human effort and divine will. There's a balance. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us a third for your food, a third for water, and a third for air. There's a balance. You were created with a balance. Everything is balanced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا He balanced your desire as well. So you're not too much in desire and you're not too much of worship. You have fujur in you 
and you have taqwa within you. Now it's up to you where you lead your soul to, where you lead yourself. Also we have in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu three men come to his house. One of them said, I'm not going to break my fast. And the other says, I'm not going to sleep, I'm going to pray the night. And the third says, I'm not going to marry a woman. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told this, he said, as for me, I fast and I break my fast. And I sleep during the night and I pray during the night and I marry the woman. And this is my sunnah, meaning the balance is his sunnah. That's the balance that Allah teaches us and the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam teaches us. So much so that at the end, what are we known as? What ummah? Ummatan wasata. A middle nation, a balanced nation. Not like the Jews, you know, in the Surah Al Fatiha, we say, Ghayri al Maghdub alayhim wa la dalim. Because al Maghdub alayhim, the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or those that earned the anger of Allah, which an example of are the Jews. The Jews, what did they have? They had a lot of knowledge and less action. And those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused to, or misguided, those that are lost, those people that are lost, an example of them are the Christians. The Christians don't care about knowledge. All they care about is action. So their action is more than their knowledge. You see the imbalance in the two sides? But Allah calls us Ummat al Wasata. Why? Because Islam teaches us the more knowledge, the more action. So now there's a balance between the knowledge and the action. So we ask Allah, غير المغضوب عليهم and غير الغير الضالين as well. So we're this balance. So Allah said, الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك. This is Allah's karam. This is Jesus' generosity upon you. He didn't only create you, and then He didn't only fashion you and say, go goodbye, go do whatever you want. Rather then He gave you a whole balanced legacy. How are you going to live your life balanced, you know? Time for your family, time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, time for friends, time for... All of it is balanced. There's no excuse. الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ فَعَدَلَكَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. In whatever form he will, he put you together. صورة in the Arabic language literally it means an object which can be seen and distinguished with the eye. You can see it and you can distinguish it. في أي صورة in any form, in whatever form he will, he rakabak. He put you together. Rakab is an interesting word. It comes from the word tarkib. And literally that means to put one thing on top of another. That's tarkib. So for example, a rider is called a rakib because he goes on top of the horse or on top of the camel or whatever he's riding. Rakib. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did tarqib in us, however He wanted. So that could mean that يعني, one cell connected to the other cell, one skin connected to the other cells of skin, one limb connected to the other, you know, the bones connected to another bone, the vessels, the veins, the arteries connected to one another. Just think of it as Legos. You get a Lego, you put on top of each other, that's tarqib basically. If you want to give an understanding to your children or so, give him a bunch of Legos, put them together. That's Tarqib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this in you, did this in us. في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كلا بل تكذبون بالدين. After this profound and amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the human being, after this amazing balance, this well-fashioned human being, after Allah made you the best of creation, Allah gave you so much, 
He owes you nothing, but he kindly gave you so much things because he is Kareem. Now your conscience, your conscience should already tell you that you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you need to obey him, that as much as you obey him and you thank him, you can never thank him. You need to submit to Allah and you need to acknowledge that you're the slave and truly be a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to follow his command. That's what your conscience will tell you after you read this ayah. But Allah says, Kalla. No, not at all. What this implies is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's disappointment with the human being. The reality is, that's the reality. I've given you all this. Your conscience should have led you towards Allah. Rather, what do we find? We find you lying against the deen. This is what we actually find. So Allah says, Kalla. Contrary to your to the to the conscience. That's why you, your mind and your conscience didn't come up with this. It came up with something else. Rather, we find you on the other hand, to You're making takdeeb against the deen. Let's take this word for word so we can understand. Takdeeb is when you call someone a liar falsely. If you call someone a liar falsely, that means you're calling yourself a liar. By calling him a liar and he's not, you're calling yourself a liar. And this Kuffar Quraysh, they made lies against the deen by telling people that this deen is a lie. Remember in the previous surah, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ That means Quraysh were telling people, صَاحِبُكُمْ مَجْنُونَ And that this word is the word of Shaytan al-Rajim. So they lied against the truth, making them themselves liars. So this is the first way of a takvib bid-deen. The other way of takvib bid-deen, when you lie against someone's truthful claims, if you just deliberately, with no reason, deny someone's truthful claims, then that's takvib as well. So the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it claims to be true. The Qur'an claims to be the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they lie against this and they lie against this. So they say, no, it's not the word of Allah, it's the word of the devil. So they lied against what the Qur'an claimed and that is takdeeb. So takdeeb two things. Takdeeb is two things to turn away people from the message and you yourself, you don't believe in the message. Two horrible crimes. It's one thing, you don't believe in the message, what do you want from others? So you know, there's two things. Two horrible crimes. They don't believe and they turn away others from this religion. You know, this is yani when, uh, when the idea of a sin comes. You know, it's common that people say, oh, it's known, there's like an Arabic phrase, they say, لا ذنب بعد الكفر. There is no sin after kufr. If you're a kafir, do whatever you want. After it, there is no major sin. But there is a sin bigger than kufr. And that is الصد عن سبيل الله. To turn people away from the truth. So yourself, you did takfir. That's fine, move away. But to come back and to turn people away from the message, that's even worse. So Allah says, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And then, صَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ He said, زِدْنَاهُمْ عَذَابًا فَوْقَ الْعَذَابِ People that don't believe, and they turn people away from the message, they don't just deserve a normal punishment like anyone else. Allah said, we'll increase and multiply the punishment for them. Above the already the punishment they have. Adab and fawq al adab. For this is takrib. This is how, this is the ultimate forms of takrib. Allah says, Kalla bal tukadhibuna 
bid-deen. What do they lie against? Said they lie against a deen. A deen comes from the word dain. Dain is alone. Alone. Dana is to give someone what you owe them completely. Give someone their precise portion back. And that is Islam. Some of the ulama will say that you lie against the deen, which is Islam, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say that a deen is yawm al deen. Because towards the end of the surah, Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينَ So, no, kalla. Rather, we find you lying against the Day of Judgment, basically. That's the other opinion. But anyway, they're both similar. Because if you deny Islam, then obviously you deny the Day of Judgment. If you believe in Islam, then of course you believe in the Day of Judgment. So again, this yani, shows you the, the, yani, the comprehensive nature of the Qur'an. Now, Islam, it was referred to deen. Deen said means alone. You know why? Because everything we do and everything we say is set forward. And everything we leave behind as well is being written and recorded. And all of this is being precisely calculated. And if it's good on the Day of Judgment, you, will be, you are owed precise amounts of good in return. And even if, if it's evil, you are owed precise amounts of evil in return. That's why it was called a deen. Because any good you do here, Allah gives you exactly what you deserve, Yawm al -qiyam. This is before the extra reward He gives you. So this is, وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ In another ayah, وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ Any good you do, Allah will give you exactly, exactly, precisely to the sec, to the, yeah, to the precise amount of what you gave. So that's why it was called deen, which came from deen, it's alone. Allah will give you back exactly the good, the reward that you deserve. And you did bad, you'll get precisely the amount of bad you did. But then on the Day of Judgment, after that's done, when you enter paradise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of the paradise, then everything He gives you there is jaza'an min rabbika ata'an hisab. It is, it doesn't, it's not equal to what you did, but that's just out of the generosity of Allah, out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's immense reward that He gives you. Now, after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Kalla and, and we said that this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically what he's refuting is refuting or is uh, is, is refuting the idea of that with all this balance we created you what with all this balance we find you lying against the deen Kalla bal deen in the previous surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us how kuffar Quraysh and any kafir after them, how they do takdeeb against the deen. How do they do this? Allah said, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ They accuse the messenger of being insane. That's how they do takdeeb against the deen. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَلِينَ They say the Rasulullah is cheap when it comes to information. He doesn't give it out. That's another way in how they lie against the deen. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And that's the third way they lied against the deen. They said that this is the word of a devil. Now, for people that lie against the deen, you better know the consequences of lying against the deen. It's not something you can do and get away with it and move on and just depend on بِرَبِّكَ uh, الْكَرِيمِ Generous and it will go by. These words you said are sent forward. We remember we read Alimat Nafsum Ma Qaddamat. We said Qaddamat, any action or word you say, good or bad, is sent forward. When you lie against the deen, when you utter these words of lie against this deen, then these words are recorded in the bad scroll 
in the bad book and they're sent forward. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reminds you of this reality. He reminds us of this reality. He says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ Indeed, verily, certainly, no doubt about it, over all of you, عَلَيْكُمْ all of you, there are guardians, there are guards, there are angels. لحافظين. Allah referred to the angels as حافظين here. Now, عَلَيْكُمْ comes before حافظين. The normal way in the Arabic, we'd say وَإِنَّ حَافِظِينَ عَلَيْكُمْ Right, that would be pushed to the end. But when it comes before حافظين, it creates this sense of shock. So, shockingly enough, but the reality is that there is over you angels. There are gods. That's, that's how it's understood when عَلَيْكُمْ comes first. Allah referred to these angels as حافظين. حافظين comes from the word حافظة. Which is used, this word حافظة is used when you guard something so that it doesn't, or so that what's inside doesn't escape. That's حافظة. That's when it's used. So for example, if you're guarding a building and there's a fence, you're standing on the fence, you're a حافظ only when you are there making sure no one leaves. Right? This is حافظ. And interestingly enough, the one that has memorized the Qur'an, they refer to him as حافظ Qur'an. Why? Because in his mind, there is the ayat of Qur'an, so he keeps revising, so they cannot escape. That's a حافظ. Someone that's around the border, preventing things from coming out. Now, that's how Allah referred to the angels. We'll see why. But subhanAllah, there's something first to contemplate and ponder over before we move on. What's interesting here is that the chain of surah so far that we have discussed, each and every single surah mentioned a type of angel. So let's begin. We, we began with Surah An Naba. In Surah An Naba, there was mention of angels. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا." On the day in which a ruh, which is Jibril, and all the angels will be standing before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in rows. So in Surah An Naba, there was a comprehensive. Mention of the angels, all the angels. The surah that's after it, Surah al Nazi'at, there was also a mention of angels. Which angels? Huh? The, angel of death. the angels that pull out the souls. The surah that's after al Nazi'at, Surah Abasa, there was also a mention of angels. Which angels? No, that's right. The Aidi Safara, Kiramin Barara. The angels that what? That record the revelation. That was a mention of angels. The Surah after Abasa, which is Surah Al Taqweer, there was also a mention of angels. There was a mention of the angel who? Jibreel. In where Allah says, Rasulin Kareem, the Quwatin Inda the Arshi Makin. And now in Surah Al Infitar, there's another type of angels that's mentioned, and this is the angels that are basically guardians over and upon us, that record your sins and your good deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ Basically the idea is that everything they write in this book, it doesn't come out. It's not erased. It's written. Whether you did it in good intention or bad intention, whether you didn't know about it and so on, it's all written. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kiraman katibin. Kiraman. They are noble. And part of their nobility is that they're not corrupt. You know, you can only appreciate this description towards the angels when you understand it in the sense of guards, 
in this life. A guard in this life, a security guard, or any guard that's guarding any premises or a building, they have moments of laziness. Moments in where they sleep, they go for a lunch break, you know, stops guarding and doing something else for a few seconds, for a few minutes. That happens, that's normal. That's worldly guards. But these guards that Allah told us about, the angels, He described them as kiraman. Kiraman, we said, means noble. The nobility is part of their job. When something needs to be guarded, it needs to be kept safe from corruption. So your deeds are going to be recorded. Each and every single deed. These angels are not corrupt. Their kiraman and part of their nobility is that they record every single thing you do. Now you know in this world a guard, for example if he's guarding in the football stadium and he knows you, he can sort of slip you through. You'll go through the doors, you know? Or he's guarding at night and he's not allowed to open the gate, he knows you'll open the gate for you. That's corruption. That's not kiraman. But the angels are not like this. They don't have a relation with us. They're just sitting there and they write every single thing you do. So um, uh, we said, we mentioned this last week. They write everything and everything is sent forward because they don't know your intention. So they have to write everything. So, so a guard can only be true to his job by being noble. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That's another description. And this is amazing because Allah doesn't say kiraman yaktubun. Katibin yaktubun comes from kataba, which means to write. But what's the difference? Katibin is a noun, yaktubun is a verb. And I've said this many times, a noun always refers to what? <laughs> Permanency. Something that's happening continually. And a verb refers to something being temporary. So what do we understand? That the angels are riding, 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 riding non-stop. You think they stop when you die? No. Because ma'akharat. When you die, what traces of good you left? And they keep riding. What traces of bad you left? And it's riding. Up until the day of judgment. So this is katibin. Allah used the nominal uh, tense, which is a, yani katibin is isim fa'al, an active verb in which it's a noun and a noun alludes to permanency so the day they started writing it never stopped the pen never went down and i'll tell you exactly what this means it's manifest and it's understood in this ayah here now Ya'lamuna ma taf'alu. Ya'lamun. they know every single thing you do now in this world there's two ways you can pass the guard one, we said you have connections and he slips you through. The other way is that he turns this way for a second and you walk in without his knowledge. So Allah says, يعلمون. You can't escape without their knowledge. Allah says, they know. They know every single thing and every single minute and second what you do. يعلمون ما تفعلون. And what I want to share with you now. Allah said, يعلمون ما Taf'alun. Taf'alun means what you do. What's another word for what you do? No, there's, uh, there's fi'l and there's amal. Ta'malun, right? So the ayah wasn't, Ya'lamuna ma ta'malun. That would have been more appropriate because it's the same verb. Ya'lamun ma ta'malun. But he said, Ya'lamun ma ta'falun. Amal and fi'l. Loosely translating these two, they both mean what you do. Amal and fi'l is what you do. But what's the difference? So you can appreciate what's here. Fi'l is a more general term. It's used to describe actions that are intended and actions that are not intended. That's what... Which one is this? That's fi'l. Let's just speak in terms of fi'l and amal now. Fi'l is the verb that describes any action you do, whether you intended, whether you didn't intend it. 
So for example, for example, you intend to pray Salat al isha that's fair. What's something you don't intend? Give me an example. Blinking. You blink your eye. You know, is that something you don't intend? You know, you shake your leg. Sometimes people sit and they shake without intention. Sometimes you look at something oh, you didn't intend to look at it. You don't intend to do this, but you did. Uh, this is all fa'al. You intend or you don't intend. You know, maybe you're sleeping in bed and you move a couple of times left and right. You don't intend that. That's what fa'al. Allah is saying that angels, they record what? Your what? Your amal or your fa'al? Your fa'al. That means they record what you intend and what you do not intend. Amal, on the other hand, only refers to intended actions. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Not إِنَّمَا الْأَفْعَالِ إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالِ So amal is something, is an action that you intend. So fa'al is the more comprehensive word, the most general word. And amal is only special to things you intend. But Allah said, what do they know? They know what taf'alu, meaning they know what you do with intent. They, sorry, they record what you do of acts intentionally and what you do of acts unintentionally. It's a very scary ayah. Hey, that means if you're outside and some of these days that are hot, and you're out in the shopping mall and you didn't intend off obviously to look at the woman or this fitna that's in front of you all these billboards that are on the road on the street you don't intend to look at it you look for one second and astaghfirullah you moved your eye away that's recorded that's recorded now don't be confused on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he judges you according what According the amal, not the fa'al, Allah says, وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ Not مَا فَعَلَتْ And then he says, وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَفْعَلُونَ He's going to, he's going to judge you upon مَا عَمِلَتْ What you did with intention. But then he adds, وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَفْعَلُونَ But he knows what you did unintentionally. He knows it. But he's only going to judge you what you did intentionally. That's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَوُفِّيَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَفْعَلُونَ وَيَعْنَ Allah says in another ayah وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ as well. So what he, what actually Allah Azza wa Jal judges you according to مَا عَمِلَتْ But the angels, they write مَا فَعَلَتْ Why do they write everything? Because they don't know your intention. They don't know your intention. The angels are surprised on the day of judgment. You did an evil act and it's written a hasan. You thought of an evil act and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, write a hasan. They're confused. Why? Why a hasan? Because then Allah explains in the hadith, he wanted to do a sin, but then he didn't do the sin. فَكْتُبُوهَا لَهُ hasan. So then it's written for him as a hasan. The angels can't judge. They just have to write. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at this, look how scary this is. Allah says, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا On that day, the angels wrote for this man so many hasanat, so many that Allah says, قَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ Just action after action after hasanat. What happens on the Day of Judgment? Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We reduced it to dust because this man's intention wasn't sincere. The angels are shocked, they don't know about this. They just record. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows the intention behind the action. So their job is to only present forth what they saw from Him. But then look how beautifully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in the Qur'an. He says, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا And Allah is the best of guardians. 
the best of gods. Because these angels, they are a god. They are kiram and katibir. They are noble. They, they don't, they don't, they're not corrupt and they don't cheat in their job. But when Allah described himself, he said he is khayrun hafidha. He's a better god because he knows the intention. And there's no more level after this. Kiram and katibir, ya'lamuna ma taf'alun. Now, on that day, with your sins and with your good deeds, there's only two parts. Two parts. And these are the two parts that Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. There can only be two outcomes. Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. And on the other hand, wa inna al-fujjara lafi jahim. These are the two outcomes. Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. What an amazing name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, al-abrar, we'll just say al-abrar now, lafi na'im, are already in bliss. They're already in happiness. Al-abrar are the righteous, righteous people. Why does Allah refer to the righteous as abrar? The word abrar comes from the word bir or bar. Bir means to be righteous, like the Bir al-Walidayn, being dutiful towards your parents. So they were called Abrar, righteous, because they were dutiful towards Allah. But there's another interesting one. Bar. You know what Bar means? Who, know what, who knows what Bar is? Land. Bar is land. Opposite to what? Bah. Bahr is what? Ocean. Allah called the Abrar, Abrar, which comes from the word bar, which means land. Because land, compared to ocean, which one is most stable? Land. So he called them abrar because they're stable in their faith, just like the land. Not like the ocean. The ocean is left and right, you're, you're wobbly on the ocean, you're not on balance. So he called them abrar righteous, giving us the idea that they're solid, they're like land. When it comes to Iman, what, what about them? He says, Lafi Na'im. Uh, interestingly, this Lafi means they're already in. He doesn't say, Inna al Abrar sayakununa fi Na'im. The Abrar will be in bliss. He says, Al Abrar Lafi Na'im. It's already been the case. They're already in bliss. Subhanallah. What do we understand from this? What's the greatest Na'im Allah has given us? Islam. So the moment you're in Islam, you've already felt this bliss. You felt this na'im. And this when it was recited to the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, how much of encouragement was in this ayah? It's like Allah is telling you it's already the case, you're already in bliss. And lafi na'im also uh, it gives the idea of permanent permanent bliss so now you're in bliss with the quran being in your heart with the quran being in your house that's naim with the remembrance of allah the heart finds rest and tranquility and peace then when you die the believer in his grave if he's a believer and he's in his grave to his right a window to the paradise is open He's in bliss again. When he comes out on the day of judgment, for some we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of people that are under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those people again, <coughs> that the case they're in bliss. And then the final entrance to Jannah, to the paradise, and that's lafi na'im. So you see this na'im is only, only limited to this world. It's here. And it's in your grave, and it's on the day of judgment, and it's up until you enter the paradise. That's the case of an abrar. And on the other hand, when the fujjar lafi jahim. And as for the fujjar, fujjar comes from the word fajara. Fajara, we said already to explode. Now, how beautifully does this connect? In the beginning of the surah, what does Allah say? Wa al bihar fujjar. There was a mention of the oceans exploding. So the, the, the Fajr is someone that exploits in sin. He rebels against Allah. He doesn't have any limit. 
And interestingly, this explosion was used for the sea and for the believer, lead is stable. And for the Persian, he's not stable. He's like the ocean, he goes up and it's like a ship on an ocean. Even if you're on the ship, you're going left and right. It's like that's already the case. They're already in Jahim. That's their case. And, and we said Jahim already, what it means, it comes from the word Jahama. Jahama is the verb that's used to describe the stare of a hungry lion. If a hungry lion stares at you, that means he's coming for you. And that's a scary sight in itself. So Jahim was called, the fire was called Jahim because it has a stare. It has a stare. Allahu alam how this stare is. Allah says in another ayah, إِذَا رَأَتْهُمْ مِنْ مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ When it sees them from a far distance, from a far place, سَمِعُوا لَهَا تَغَيُّهًا وَزَفِيرًا They will hear its roar and its rage. So Allah says, وَإِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ Then he said, and he said, it's already the case. So now, they're in Jahim. They're in Jahim. Don't think for one second that a kafir, he lives his life relaxing. Doesn't. There's no relaxation. You know, you might see on TV the celebrities and the stars and the presenters and so on. They have mansions and cars and... And then a few years later, he, he died suicide. He killed himself. Or drug overdose. What does this tell you? On TV, he apparently looked like he was living the Naeem. But really, really, behind closed doors, he was living in Jahim. That's the reality. So Allah says they're fi Jahim. Because their heart is empty. It's empty. When someone submits to Allah, when he accepts Islam, Islam as his faith and religion, it fills your heart. Amma the kafir, the fajr, his heart, there's no religion. There's no faith. So he'll party every day. He'll drink all day and night. He'll disobey Allah day and night. And he still isn't full. He's still empty. So the next day he does the same thing and the same thing and the same thing and always does this. The heart is empty. But when he comes to Islam, Islam... Subhanallah, it's like concrete. It just fills that gap in the heart. And then that's it. You're in Naim. So Lafi Jahim. They're in Jahim. Now, when they die, we ask Allah to, we seek refuge in Allah from Adab al Qabr. Adab al Qabr will be another Jahim for them. In the, far, in, the, in the grave, a window in the left will be open. And he'll see his position and his place. In the fire, more jahim. He'll come out on that day, he'll be drowning in his sin because the sun is so close to his head. More jahim. And eventually, he'll be thrown in jahim. So that's the final lafi jahim. Then Allah says, Yaslawnaha yawm ad deen. Yaslawnaha, they'll trip into it. They'll trip into this jahim. Yawm al deen on the day of recompense. On the day where everyone gets what they deserve, basically. We already said what ad deen means. And yaslawnaha is an interesting verb. Yaslawnaha comes from the verb salyun. And salyun, it is only a verb that's used for the fire. And it gives us the idea that they will burn in the fire. You know, you can burn close to the fire. You don't have to be in the fire. You can burn. You're one meter away from the, hot, from the flame, from the hot, intense flame, and your skin will start to melt. That can happen. You know, from heat, exposure. But the word Yaslawnaha illustrates that these people, they won't suffer as a result of heat exposure or smoke inhalation. They will yaslawnaha. They will burn in the flame. That's yaslawnaha. The flame is burning and they're put in the middle of this flame. That's salyun. On the day of deen, yawm ad deen. Then Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ عَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ Very scary ayah this one. 
Because وَمَا هُمْ عَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ Translates to they will not be absent. They will not be turned away from this jaheem. Subhanallah. وَمَا This ma is a powerful way of negating something. You know there are two words in the Arabic to negate a statement. You can say laysa and ma. Allah doesn't say laysu anha. He says wa ma hum. And ma is more powerful than laysa. Then he says bigha'ibin. And this ba in bigha'ibin. So the ma at the beginning coupled with the ba gives you the most powerful, powerful of negations. A man coupled with bad. So Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ عَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ Not at all. They will never, ever, ever be absent from this jaheem. And they will not be absent from its stare. Because the word for the fire was jaheem. So when Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ عَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ They won't be absent from its stare. So it'll stare at them and they will have to stare back at it. No matter how they turn their face, it'll be in front of them staring at them as they're burning. More psychological torture. You know, if you see a hungry lion staring at you, what can ease the pain a little bit is that you close your eyes and you try to not look at it. Maybe you know it's going to come attack you, but at least it will it'll reduce the suffering and this uh, torture in your mind. But Allah said this does not the case. This is not the case. It stares at them and they stare back at it. I'll conclude here inshallah ta'ala and we'll continue the remainder of the surah because there's a few more things that we have to explain with the last three ayat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us students of the Quran, people who benefit from the reminders of the Quran. إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين